This is a production of Cornell University. Welcome to Mann Library's Chats in the Stacks book talk series. In today's talk, originally presented at Mann Library on March 10th, 2010, Herbert Gottfried of the Department of Landscape Architecture and Jan Jennings of the Department of Design and Environmental Analysis trace the contributions to America's built environment made by folk vernacular architecture across the country and show how certain key factors together affected the transformation of American vernacular architecture from regional ethnic product to a national system of technology-driven buildings. It's been about uh, 25 years since we've done tag team presentations in public. <laughs> but we have had a lot of experience at doing it. This book and the books that preceded this book came out of historic preservation practice. We started, Jan was the director of historic preservation in the city of Tulsa when we first met. And I was teaching architectural history at Oklahoma State University and that's how we got connected professionally as well as uh, emotionally <laughs> from that point on. And we began working in preservation in Oklahoma first and then we worked in Iowa and Wyoming and as we worked in these places, we discovered that there was another system afoot in the making of these places. The traditional system for making is the kind of thing we understand in places like New York, even upstate New York, where we get layers of cultural intention piled up on top of each other each time some other group comes to a particular place and builds something in the manner in which they're accustomed to building. And these places accumulate to make a fabric of their own. And then other intentions come along and either build on top of those or shove them out of the way or do something with them to create this alternative system. The methods by which people learn to build and the manner in which the building materials they will use travel across the country changes once you cross the Mississippi River. At least historically it does, that we discovered that. And then we began to look at whether or not these changes were also evident in other regions of the country and found out that they were. So we began to look at finally what people who traditionally deal with this subject matter, would find to be a national system of building, not just a regional system. The regional systems still exist because of climate, but not necessarily because of materials or because of ideas about how to build buildings. And so that's where we started. And this book is the culmination of this effort for the last 25 years of trying to put this whole thing together. We began by constructing a database out of the things that were used to construct exterior and interior portions of these buildings. And then we began to interpret that database. And those interpretations with a redefined database are in this book. That's what this is about. The folk architecture that you may be familiar with if you live in some parts of the country where you, there's still some of it standing is stuff like this. This is the Matthias Pfeiffer house. This is my fourth great grandfather's house. Built about 1805 in Rowan County, North Carolina by him as an old man and his son John, who's my third great grandfather. And this house is a log house, covered over, it's half dovetailed notched logs on the corners, covered over with thin, locally made clappards, handmade nails. The plan is the William Penn plan, it's called. The cultural diffusion of that plan came from Philadelphia down through the Great Wagon Road into Virginia, then into North Carolina. And the chimneys, which you can see on this particular shot on the other side are Flemish Bond chimneys, which are also not local for log houses. So grandpa here built this place using this Pennsylvania idea, this mental idea, this construct or concept he carried with him from other German speaking people. The ones he first met often, these Germans of mine, would go to Pennsylvania, meet some Germans and then go meet some more Germans in Virginia and then go meet some more Virginians in North Carolina, North Carolina and stay there with these German families. And German families lived all around them. And so the local skill level was here, the local artisan level, and the plan, which had, this, had a lot of flexibility, movement up and down through the coast, and that's this kind of folk architecture. We don't study that. <laughs> we both come from <laughs> colonial era families. And so all of our families have lived in these things for the, since the middle of the 17th century and the middle of the 18th century. So we know what those are, and we've been to see some of them, we know how they work, but we were interested in the other stuff. The other stuff comprises 90% of the American built environment. So we wanted to know, what is that? How does it work? Who made it? How did they make it? All those sorts of things. And we believe that the, the systems of belief often that are built in even in these buildings and the buildings that we'll show you today will carry through for a long period of time. So what we're looking at are things like this. This is a storefront. 
Its location is unknown, but it is an iron front. You can see these iron members. These are all cast pieces. These are the kind of things that are made in some factory, some shop, sand cast or mold cast. And then they could be assembled by nuts and bolts, like an erector set. You ever had one of those when you were a kid? And you could put them up all around the country. Bridges were made in the same kind of fashion. And the uses, once you got inside this metal frame, once you move through that, you could have all kinds of retail or otherwise commercial uses on the inside of that. And lots of these properties have been maintained. The distribution of this material is part of what interests us. How does the material, where does it start from, where does it emanate, how does it get from one place to the other? And the systems will change. In the beginning, of course, it's by boats and wagons and things of that sort. But the key element for us, especially from 1870 on, was the railroad. The railroad would deliver the goods no matter where you went, all over the country, in trunk lines and little feeder lines until anybody could order this kind of material up and build something in the place where they wanted to build. To figure out what this system was about, we relied on, we had to find a way, what we're basically doing is trying to sample millions of buildings in a manner in which we could make a case for defining this particular kind of architecture. So how did we do that? We did it in these kinds of ways. We did some field work because we did surveys of cities and locations. We relied on historic preservation surveys. Since the, since the 1970s, most everything's been surveyed in the United States, and that stuff is of record. And we could look at it and try to figure out what they built in those particular places. We used manufacturers' trade catalogs. We could go to a trade catalog like Mesker Brothers from St. Louis and find you this exact frame in, in iron that somebody could have ordered. It would have a product number. Later on, it'll have a trade name on it, but it'll have a product number first. You could simply order it, get it shipped, and build it in your town. We looked at plan books. Those are books by architects who designed some plans for the, for the organization of space and the makings of buildings. And then they often suggest in these same books elevations, what these things might look like if you actually built them. We used extension bulletins, including the ones written right here at Cornell, beginning with the Bailey's uh, home courses for farmers and then farmers' wives. Historic photograph collections. Most of those are digitized these days and online, so you could look at historic photographs of places. And lastly, we used eBay. Jan bought <laughs> thousands of dollars worth of photographs off of eBay. Because on eBay, we could find historic pictures <coughs> And they would have context often, and they would have identification as to where and when this thing was built, and we would buy them. And those pictures show up in this book. I was even nervy enough. I was invited at one time to, uh, for, for a group of historians, uh, female historians at Cornell, to come and tell about their archive stories to undergraduates. And I talked about eBay as a research uh, archive, <laughs> but it also saved us getting permissions for m most of the photographs that are in this book. We're going to talk first about the premises that uh, we worked from. And the first of these is that buildings were constructed with manufactured materials. This is a trade book cover that you're looking at from Sears Roebuck about in, I'm guessing, 1915, 1917. That's a little modern colonial house in the distance. And on either side, you see the columns, you see some French doors. All of that kind of stuff went into these buildings, uh, particularly the modern colonial. And secondly, you see what is remarkable about this particular kind of architecture. And then women, for the most part, were charged with it. Not to design it, but to understand it, to be able to read a plan, uh, to make the negotiations with the contractor or contractors and builders. Um, and you s even uh, Martha Van Rensselaer and all of the extension bulletins produced here at Cornell are teaching women how to be articulate in domestic architecture. Um, I thought I had something here. For this, one. this particular picture is a lot of fun because it says, it has all time iconographic information. Normally in depictions of dogs, the dog represents fidelity symbolically, and it's usually looking at the master, and especially in fascist countries, <laughs> that's particularly true. But they're looking, at, but this dog is looking at the woman, and she is looking at the plan, and the husband's looking at the elevation, and the contractor's looking at the husband because he's paying for it, he thinks, and the kid, no one's paying attention to the kid, but he's holding up the dimension lumber, which came out of the process. He's so the, it's a good the summary. He's boy. The, what you, something like that. He's got big boots, see? Okay, you're up. The, um, oh, this, one other factor about this, you have to remember, that since this is industrialization we're dealing with, and that these parts are interchangeable. Just like Mr. Colt's parts on his original handgun, 
If you broke your trigger, you broke your hammer, the broke the whatever you have, you could simply wait a colt and get a new one in from Connecticut, put it back into that gun, it would work just as well as it used to. Well, these parts become interchangeable in a similar kind of way. But only within the company. They were not interchangeable, they were not prefabricated or standardized except within a company. So you could pick anything you choose from their system and it would work. The conversion of timber to lumber is a major development. This is a wood-based society we live in, still is, although that's changing because we now get wood that's integrated with plastic and things <laughs> of that sort. But nevertheless, it's a wood-based society, including New York once led in the production of, of lumber. And then that lumber gets redimensioned from its original cut down to a millwork. And we followed millwork a lot. Well, millwork is all the finished goods. And we follow that a lot as a way to understand changes over time. This is a little schematic for you of how one of these places gets put together. This is a, a house in Wisconsin. It's a rural kind of setting, but you can see the layering that's going on to make it. It's unfinished yet. You see the, the building paper behind the clapboards are going on. This is a group of people who are involved somehow in this construction, probably the family that also owns it. But this is it's a stick-built environment that gets applications on every surface of these kinds of wood-based material products. And that's what makes, for the most part, most of this stuff work, although there's masonry and other stuff too, but wood is a fundamental element. The second premise is that these buildings were planned from the inside out, and I know that's a tired cliche that designers and architects like to use, lots of people like to use, and it really isn't true. But in this time period, uh, an extraordinary thing had occurred. In the English system first, and then in the American one, the in exterior and interior were seen as parallel constructs. They were not alike. They were differentiated by the treatments, the way they were discussed. They were distinct zones that were not together. And so in this about 1930-something plan, you see an axonometric of the plan with space planning, with furniture in it, and it's dimensioned. And then you can choose those three different mantles to go in it. You can even choose, this is an elevation of the kitchen and an elevation of um, the living room. But this system produced a, a completely different theoretical way of thinking about them, where the exterior was really all about the aesthetics for the most part. And the interior was all about this convenient arrangement, this theory that bubbles up through all of this literature of domestic reformers and architects and all kinds of people, when in the middle of the 19th century, in the northeast portion of the country where we are right now, a group of women, primarily women, but some men, domestic reformers, decided that women had the moral authority for their home. And that also, I'm not sure that ever worked in the South or even in the, the Southwest, but certainly there was a cadre of women who believed it was their moral obligation for their family to plan the interior properly. It had to do with their education, it had to do with their health. It was everything about how they lived. And there was a lot of literature that comes from this. So there's a thing called convenient arrangement. It's a theoretical concept that if I were to describe it to you today by each of those principles, you would imagine that it's all of the givens that you already know. There are already all the standards that you already know and would not question about what goes into good house planning. And those include actual convenience, it's about circulation, step saving was a known thing by that name in the 1880s. Martha Van Rensselaer picked it up again and makes terrific um, diagrams for it, little schematics to show uh, farm women, rural women, uh, that they're spending too much, they're taking too many steps in their kitchen because it's not organized correctly. And there's only, all of these accumulated principles only had one form of representation, and that is the plan. And it really stood, it was the thing that everyone could read to determine if you had a good house, a good moral house, a good healthy house, or not. And women became very adept at criticizing plans. They often wrote into newspapers about it. Uh, the other side of this uh, 
little booklet that we have for you illustrates our point in that you establish the plan first because it's the most important thing ever and then you choose an outside style or aesthetic or treatment, however you want to call them. They were all interchangeable. It's the same plan with six different versions of how you might decorate it, in fact. Oh, I'm on the next one. Yeah, <laughs> And then the third premise, uh, we talk about, it's very clear to us by this third book, by the third study, that the picturesque is theoretically the aesthetic that we never seem to get rid of. It has a deep hold on the American imagination. Uh, we like to see our landscapes in picturesque modes. We like these relationships and the massing in all of these buildings. Since Herb showed you a picture of his family house, that's my great-grandparents' house in Canyon on the top. Uh, the photographs of this period, because interior photography was unreliable, uh, you often see domestic settings being set up outside the house so that a photograph could be taken. And in this particular scene, you see all of that millwork and some art glass you know, setting that picturesque stage. And in the picturesque, you get lots of different kinds of massing. There's lots of things going on. Can we stay there for a second? Yeah. This, this, this is not an accident that this family <coughs> portrait's taken in front of this elevation. Because the, the activation of this wall by all of these materials represent a fundamental and aesthetic theory for the picturesque. The best book that we know on the picturesque is Inquiry into the Picturesque by Sid Robinson, 1991, University of Chicago Press book. Sid's got a good book on theory about this. And one of those theory issues that he comes up with, remember the theory is 18th century, 18th century landowners in England reacting to centralized authority in, in London, uh, breaking up a landscape which is not as fully authoritarian as a French garden might be, but instead is full of things which are unpredictable. And there's a high sense of contrast as you move from one part of the garden to the other. That shows up in the 19th century in changes in materials. So we move in the house, the Wallace house up above, from shingles up there in those gables to clapboards down below. And they are, in one sense, the contrast is favored by the rough against the smooth. In the modern world, like the seats you're sitting on here, the machine finish on these things suggests that this finish right here is good. It's machine, it's modern, it's contemporary, it's part of our world view. Not in the picturesque, it's not. The machine's not an improvement over the rough. It's just an alternative condition. And you can't predict when one appears after the other. So contrast and irregularity and abrupt variations, those are the things that these elevations are made up of, and that's why people chose them for this kind of scenographic reality. This is a little theater for them where they can make this family portrait. The fourth premise is that everyone loves the cottage. Again, in the American imagination, this just hasn't gone away. And a cottage is a complicated room, roof plan. It's got these big intersecting volumes, and it results in these robust, expressive forms. You can see all of these, in fact, are a hiptera cottage that have had extra stuff put on them that are actually stylistic. They're an early version of the uh, colonial revival. But you can see how extravagant, how exuberant they are. And this is a toned down version of what preceded them. This is the classical coming back in again and toning all of that millwork back down to something that um, is better. And in the picturesque and in the cottage, each elevation can be thought of as a picture. That is, each side, if you lined all those up, you would have quite an essay on massing and uh, window-to-wall relationships and so forth, and even uh, ornamentation. But on any given side of these, they were supposed to be beautiful and in themselves their own essay. And I tell you that the cottage never goes away. I plucked this off of the web this afternoon. It's a house that's for sale in Lansing. And once again, they're working with the cottage. They're trying to get that massing and failing, frankly, miserably at it. We see these giant houses like this one with an elevation that has no windows, no projecting 
elements of the wall at all, just a big blank two-story wall. Uh, but that, um, to most Americans, that kind of construction, that kind of cottage sensibility is really more appealing to people than the little modern box that Americans rejected as a, a house type. Okay, you're next. Cottages aren't always large. They can also be small. I mean, there are all kinds of scale to them. <coughs> but, but that sensibility is still, because of its relation, it so fits easily into the picturesque thinking that the cottage, they go hand in hand, those two things. Well, the fifth premise is about the depth of the colonial revival. From 1876 on, we make colonial revivals over and over again. And there's a, there's a vocabulary of elements or effects that carry with it. Even in manufactured housing, you can find little triangular pieces of pediments over doors and things that, that just carry through, that this colonial value system of ours is the dominant one. And that's, we've just come to that conclusion, I think, finally in this book, that it dominates over everything else. No other aesthetic has such continuity of application. And the colonial and the picturesque together are two of what we think of as cultural impulses. Because if we tried to derive any kind of statements we made about aesthetics on the basis of things that were alive in the culture, ideas, themes, values, and as those things worked their way through over time, then they would arrive, we thought, at the level of being a true aesthetic that could be realized fundamentally from plan out or applied from the outside in, either way. And this is a supply, I mean, this, this, this lumber company is making sure you understand that it approves of this colonial <laughs> type house if you come and buy your lumber, even. And that's a 20th century uh, catalog as well. I might also tell you at this point that the first two books, we just tried to ignore style um, and, believe, and hoped it would go away. We wanted Americans to understand the typology of their house by elements first, and so we used a lot of these little line drawings to teach them what the parts were and how they went together. And we didn't want to talk about style because that's the first thing a client always wants to know, what style is my house? And to us, that was the most unimportant thing. But finally, in this third book, we recognize it, and the thing we've come to recognize the most uh, through this study is that the colonial revival is in almost every era. It just never goes away. The National Register of Historic Places requires a stylistic classification for a property <coughs> to be listed. You have to make up something. You have to call it something. And we just resisted that impulse. We didn't want, we didn't want to get caught up in that as the first kind of gesture that you make. It's the last question you ask, not the first question that you ask, but the last one. It's because we kept reading these uh, National Register nominations, and the style name would be Romanesque Italianate Colonial. <laughs> One of the reasons why it would, it would read like that is that Americans are, by disposition, eclectic. <laughs> we like to sample. We like to take a list and take a that and put the things together. And we're clever at putting them together. And our cleverness you know, leads to these unusual compositions. Sometimes they're not so attractive, but often they're quite interesting. So it's okay. a mixture. Well, the combination of this business, this, this is the whole system in a sense, uh, it, that it's modern, convenient, picturesque, cottage, colonial, et cetera, it makes up for this national system, which is technology driven in multiple ways. One, by the delivery system, which brings all of this stuff out to the population to be used. And then secondly, by the improvements in technology in these buildings themselves to make them modern kinds of buildings, contemporary buildings. From all this, we deduce the better way to, to make some kind of generalizations about all of these buildings, and these we're talking here about houses, commercial buildings, churches, anything that's common and ordinary, was to come up with a typology logic. And so the typologies are divided up into building types. So houses, multifamily houses, and then these varieties of commercial buildings. The churches were also organized themselves into systems, and churches had plan books. Lots of the churches from central offices produced a plan book to like say bring Presbyterianism to the masses or to the frontier and when you get out there you should build a Presbyterian church in this particular kind of manner or any of those others had similar ideas. And then lastly aesthetic systems were also seen as types. We're going to talk to you a little bit now about our approach. Herb talked to you in the beginning about how we got started on this, but one of the things that happened to us when we were doing the preservation surveys 
is that we would encounter whole neighborhoods, sometimes whole towns or cities, in which we didn't have a language to describe them. That both of us had been trained in architectural history, that was, that was vocabulary that we knew, and so we indeed turned to builder's literature, which set our studies apart from some of the others. And um, the first two books were about the first about the exterior, the second about the interior, but we chose typology as the main uh, method, the main approach that we used because it simply is broad enough to take in even the folk vernacular, the vernacular, the practical architecture, and the high style. Um, it is a good accommodator for all of that. And typology also always helps. It makes a classification system, and it usually makes vocabulary. So you can look at these things, talk about them in some way. And we trained um, quite a few citizen uh, preservationist in this kind of language and thinking in terms of uh, typology. Um, secondly, the theory that drove a lot of this is George Kubler's The Shape of Time, in which he talks about design as a reiterative um, action, and that you can put together over time a chronological sequence of how people have worked out what, you know, design problems and that you can track those. So in some towns, I remember one uh, whole street in Oklahoma City, we found the same bungalow in a 10 block area, just right down the street, the same bungalow used every time and they would switch the plan from right to left. They would put a slightly different treatment in the gable. They would treat the porch a little differently. Same plan, same form, all of them. 10 blocks long. And that worked for Americans because everybody's house was different and they were delivering the same kind of living situation to a lot of people. So Kubler's theory helped us think about early and late stages of some development. I always say that in this kind of vernacular architecture or practical architecture, that it works, or it worked, or probably still works, like engaged couples who still go to a store and choose flatware and china and uh, crystal. They have no idea what they're looking at. That is, they could pick a flatware sample from 1879, a crystal pattern from 1952, and a china pattern from 1982. And that's, if the building stock remained in the market, that's what people did. So you see in many of these houses, they've got all these layers of time in it without really knowing that's what they've done. I think you're next? No, I'm next. So in the typologies of breaking out these buildings, we began first with roof form and we gathered up all of the, the gable roof cottages and then we started to look at uh, the form of them. And this is a very typical, the gable and L cottage is all over the United States and it's been interpreted from the very poorest, tiny, uh, one-story version to these really grand affairs. And we started taking a look at the shapes that they form. The two images that you see up here are that T-shape in which there's a, the projecting L comes out. It's the gable end and it can be treated in a decorative way and then on either side of that left a void and most people filled those in with some kind of porches. But the porches were rarely equal. One of those doors on a porch led to the parlor and the other one generally led to the kitchen. So there was a coating through the millwork on the outside that one was a higher order than the other. This is an 1880 uh, house on the right from uh, Binghamton, New York, designed by T.I. Lacey. Yeah. The Kubler business is about um, imagining all the things that are made in these sequences. For instance, that chair against the wall belongs to the same sequence as this chair. 
They both have, you can't, all can't see that chair back there. I could pick it up, I suppose. But it also has a similar kind of support system and that at four, at four points, that chair meets the floor. Same thing with this chair. At four points, it meets the floor. The basic problem, Kubler's <coughs> solutions are always about a problem solving. Is somehow, how do you make a device that you can lower your weight into with gravity and have that be a secure landing, give you support while you're sitting in it, underneath as well as at your back? So that chair addresses that same kind of problem, but in a different kind of format. That one's about mass and density. This one, actually, you can see through parts of it. So it's about transparency in some way. But that's just an iteration on the same scheme. If we took one of the legs away and designed some other kind of a way in which this support would actually take place, it might start another track, an alternative route coming off that original series in some way. So everything you look at, for the most part, in Kubler's view, everything that's in this room, for the most part, is part of some series of, of, of making of things to solve a problem that have a relationship to each other over time. Now, some things are uh, more interesting that maybe show up that aren't really in the sequence or aren't so obvious. For instance, in the same period in which this has, this is, uh, these houses are part of a, a development in Denver called Holiday Homes from the 1950s. And we don't know much about them because I can't find anything out about these things. So we determined that we have got to go to Denver and look for them and try to, because there were quite a few of them. We want to see what's happened to them over time if they still have some of the original shapes. But in this same time period, the ranch house has emerged right, as a primary American house type. While it may uh, get a lot of flowering in California, it ends up all over the place. It's in Ithaca. It's all over the place. I mean, it just it moves across the entire country as one of these types you can live in. And the ranch house is not a bungalow which is another type that originated in California that moved across the country. And so we have these types that get changed by climate and by locale in terms of what people can afford to build or buy in. But then along come buildings that are not like anything else that's already been produced. And that's why we like these particular ones, because these are modern in multiple ways, by their appearance, by the manner in which the construction system is somewhat exposed to those beams coming through on the outside of the roof, and by the interior spaces, if we would show you these spaces for the inside of these, they're open all the way around so that the old compartmentalization of space disappears gradually from the 19th century on to you get more and more and more openness where now open plan dominates the construction of American houses. No matter where you go, it's the same. But these, we don't even have a name for them actually yet because we don't know what to call them, but that's Actually, what interests us. There's something else I should say about this system of ours, because Jan mentioned educating people about it. We, we did all this for, the, for the, the material itself to be accessible and for the material to be practical in application. So it's practical scholarship. And we did that on purpose, because we thought that was a, an appropriate way to broadcast the knowledge we thought we'd been able to generate out of these buildings so that it would be used by people to address their own kinds of concerns about what these buildings are about. It would not take place removed from them in some way, but directly in them. So they could go around and identify whatever they were living in or wanted to buy or, some, or somebody else lived in, but that would be the whole intent of it. It would be a useful kind of system. So people told us in the historic preservation business, in state offices of historic preservation, they took those first two books, tore them apart, punched holes in them, <laughs> put them in binders, took them out to the field and took them out and looked for things. And the idea was that we weren't being prescriptive. We weren't saying, if it's not in our book, it doesn't exist. We're saying, in this book, you can go figure it out for yourself. If you can't find it in here, figure it out. Look through these various chapters, and then go and study it. And you, you'll come to your own conclusions about it. You don't have to rely on us to deliver the goods that way. In all of the books, we have um, we attempted to discuss aesthetic systems without really using the style word, but in this last and, and uh, no doubt final book, we use the style word. But it's a loose system. Um, it's generally delivered through millwork in terms of the architecture. Uh, there are things that uh, all of us would recognize as belonging to an artistic or an arts and craft kind of system. There are things that get mixed up. Again, on the outside of the house, you could have a colonial house and a complete arts and crafts interior. Um, we found that surprising when we first started doing these things. But the bungalow is part of what drives this aesthetic. It is this open plan, or it's more open than it has been. Uh, we have perfected the technology. We have a heating system that's now distributed all through houses, and we're not reliant on uh, fireplaces in every room. 
We no longer have to shut the door behind us when we leave a room. So it's open from the living room into the dining room. And what the, the artistic system was about, especially through millwork, was planning a view. That is, you had a, what is called an internal vista. So you see from one space to another space to another space, and that makes a small house seem bigger. Uh, there are certain conditions. These are all millwork choices again. But to have a colonnade out of quarter sawn oak, uh, to have uh, there are certain patterns of elevations that we show in the book, a fireplace and then above it two little bungalow windows. And then sometimes we get lucky in the photographs and they're inhabited uh, not only with the material culture that uh, belongs with it, but the people who live there. And we had a lot of fun trying to figure out what's going on in some of these uh, images. For the most part, people put in the pictures what they wanted other people to see. So those little prairie views of a half dugout with the family standing outside with their cruet set on a, on a table was sent back to the east to tell people, you know, it's, it's not like Ithaca, but we're, we're doing it. <laughs> in these, the system, this is a pretty high powered house. Whoever had this house had some means to furnish it uh, in the way they desired. Okay, I'm on, I'm on next. Just a note, just a footnote on that. If you, if you took the wood out of that picture, what would be left? <laughs> the piano. In terms well, of their lives the in that building, that space? The bungalows are great. I, we had a, a friend, a landscape architect in uh, Ames, Iowa, when we lived there, and she called me over to the house one day and she said, what was that wall used for? And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, the way the place is laid out, we know how to arrange the furniture. The house is telling us that. But there is this wall that looks empty. It had a side wall about this wide. And we stood there, and we stood there, and we stood there, and we finally figured it out. It was the upright piano. Uh, after we get rid of the parlor organ in the 19th century, then uh, having a piano in your house was one of those middle class aspirations about training your children in, in uh, music in some way. We also, when we could, uh, examined social history as part of this study, and uh, especially for the context of it. And I read a, a rare little example, but I think this is a good one. Then in 1920, many banks included a private space for women to conduct their banking, and it was called the stocking room, and it consisted of no more than this curtained space in one corner of the bank lobby. So we, today we may not think about a bank as a gendered environment, as a gendered setting, but it was then, and in many of these pictures you see men you know, hanging around or smoking, or there's a cuspidor there on the floor. So a woman who had business to tend to might not want to be in that environment. So she would slip behind the curtain and do whatever she needed to do about her own business. They got rid of these because women have too much money <laughs> <laughs> these days. They get access to everything. They have the money. Well, this is it, this is the end of this presentation. That says what we tried to show you, what we attempted to do here for the last 25 years is to create a comprehensive system which would explain what this kind of building is about. And it, we tried to have it include the historical process that took place around the making of these buildings. We tried to find theories of design that were appropriate for this particular kind of architecture. We tried to understand the technology that created the materials that also generated the buildings, and even the machines themselves that were created to, to process these raw materials into something else. We tried to use, use photographs in the first, uh, first time. The first two books are only drawings, only hand drawings. The last book is photographs, so we can try to provide some actual Thanks. historical context for these particular kind of buildings. We had a glossary of historical terms which includes references for where these things came from, where these building terms, the words that were people using about buildings and about building and construction the same way. 
and bibliography that's both primary and secondary, and an index. We got the bill for the index in our first quarterly report on the sales, and it must be a really good one because it cost a lot to make yeah. it by W.W. Norton. We hope you really use that index. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's a very good index. So that in sum is what we've been trying to do. And this book is our, is our last stab at somehow making some sense out of this whole thing. And we're not going to write about this anymore. This is <laughs> it. <laughs> we have finished with it. And thank you very much for coming. This has been a production of Cornell University. On the web at cornell.edu.